Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BV3D channel we'll learn how to tune the PID loop on the hot end of the Ender 3 V2. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back! Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to tune the PID loop on this Ender 3 V2, and we're going to do it the hard way. It's been said you can tune a PID loop, but you can't tune a fish. Okay, it hasn't been said very often, and it probably hasn't ever been said by anybody but me, but that's not important now. What is important is that you came here to find out how to perform a PID tuning on the hot end of your Ender 3 V2. Maybe you swapped out some of the components of the hot end or installed a compact direct drive extruder such as an E3D Himera or a BQH2. And now the thermal characteristics of the hot end are sufficiently different from the stock components that the printer is having a hard time keeping the temperature locked in. That's what happened to me when I installed a BQH2 on this Ender 3 V2. Be on the lookout for a review video coming soon. I was having a heck of a time getting the print settings dialed in for the new extruder and hot end. Apart from having a hard time getting the retraction and stringing under control, I noticed that the outer perimeters of the columns had a regular kind of wavy look to them. But then finally, finally, I happened to look at the temperature display on the LCD. It was varying by almost 10 degrees from the temperature I'd set. It would overshoot the set point and then undershoot it, and then overshoot it, and then undershoot it. If you plotted the temperature on a graph, it would look like a sine wave. It just couldn't settle in at the temperature that I had set. And this is because the PID loop had been tuned for the stock hot end components. Well, the only way to fix it then was to retune it for the new parts I had installed. Okay, I've been going on about PID loops for like a minute now, and I haven't actually said what a PID loop is. So, PID stands for Proportional, Integral, and Derivative. According to Wikipedia, a PID loop is a control loop mechanism employing feedback that's widely used in applications requiring continuously modulated control. You know, like how your 3D printer continuously tries to keep the nozzle at a particular temperature. The PID loop continuously calculates an error value, as the difference between the desired set point, such as the nozzle temperature that you want to print at, and a measured process variable such as the actual temperature measured by the thermistor in the heater block. Then math happens, the kind of math that's above my pay grade, and a correction is applied such that the nozzle temperature is maintained at or very, very close to the desired temperature. Now, manually tuning a PID loop can involve a lot of measuring and math and trial and error and time. Fortunately, computers are exceptionally good at that sort of thing, and hey, guess what? That main board inside your printer? That's a computer. And, also fortunately, the factory-installed Marlin firmware on the Ender 3 V2 includes a PID auto-tune function. Now, I said at the beginning that this is the hard way, but I only said that because the Ender 3 V2 doesn't have a way to perform a PID auto-tune from the LCD screen. There's just not a menu option for it. I mean, from Creality's point of view, they've already got things tuned in for their hot-end components, so their job is done. They're expecting you to use the stock parts, right? So, the easy way, obviously, would be using a settings menu to perform a PID tuning and then saving the results to the printer's main board. But, like I said, the way Creality has the LCD's menus set up, that's just not something you can do. Plus, Creality has Marlin configured such that when you save the settings that you can change, they're stored on the printer's micro SD card instead of the printer's main board. And that is a whole separate issue. If you swap cards between multiple printers, whatever custom settings you've made to the printer, steps per millimeter for the various axes, jerk and acceleration settings, and yes, even PID settings, stay with the card. So if you have two Ender 3 V2 printers, and you've got one with hardware modifications that absolutely require non-default settings, and maybe you installed a Bontech extruder with a 3 to 1 gear ratio, and you had to adjust the printer's e-steps. You're going to be left scratching your head if you use the micro SD card from another printer. Suddenly your extrusion values are all out of whack because that e-step value is on the card that used to be in the printer, not stored in the printer's mainboard. Okay, so before I got semi-ranty about the Ender 3 V2's settings storage, I was saying, 
The Ender 3 V2 doesn't have a way to perform a PID tuning from the LCD screen. The Marlin firmware in the printer is capable of it, but you'll need to connect the printer to a computer in order to be able to tell the printer what to do. Now, the software that we'll be using for this is Pronterface. It comes bundled with the Prusa Slicer download, so Mac and Windows users will have this available to them. Unfortunately, Mac users with a relatively current operating system on their computer, that is, Mac OS Catalina or newer, are not going to be able to run that version of Pronterface. Newer versions of Mac OS are 64-bit only and will not allow 32-bit software to run, and the official version of Pronterface is a 32-bit application. However, a quick Google search for 64-bit Pronterface for Mac saves the day with a thread on GitHub about the very thing that we searched for, a 64-bit version of Pronterface for Mac OS. Weird, right? In that thread, commenter Lionel HS did an absolutely huge favor for Mac OS users. He built the application as a 64-bit app from the source code and made it available for download. And I've got a link to it in the description. So now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. Begin with the printer off and the filament unloaded. The PID tuning process will be repeatedly heating the nozzle and we don't want the mess of filament oozing during the process. Then download and install Pronterface. And again, URLs for this are in the description. Turn the Ender 3 V2 on. Plug a USB cable between the printer and your computer. Then launch Pronterface. Select the USB interface your printer is connected to and then click the Connect button. If you're not sure which one it is, you can select different ones and try connecting to them. Once you're connected, in the terminal portion of Pronterface, type M503 and click the Send button. This command asks the printer to report on its settings and they get printed out in that terminal section. In the results, locate the PID settings and make note of the M301 line. This shows the current PID settings for the hot end. Now we're going to instruct the printer to perform the PID auto-tune. In the terminal portion of Pronterface, type M303 and then a space. That's the PID auto-tune command. Then type E0, which specifies extruder 0. In Marlin, extruders are numbered starting at 0, so that's the first one. And on most printers, that's the only one. Then type a space and S220. That specifies a tuning temperature of 220 degrees Celsius. Type another space and then C3. That specifies that we want to cycle through the auto-tuning three times. And click the send button to make it all happen. When the PID auto-tune process is finished, the results are shown in the terminal area. You can see that it calculated a new set of values for us in just a few minutes. So there's our new P, I, and D values. But the PID auto-tune process doesn't actually set the values. We have to do that ourselves. So using those new values, we'll create an M301 command. M301 is the set hot end PID command. I'll type M301 and a space, and then I'll just copy the values from the auto-tune output and paste them in. There's the P value, so I'll type a P and paste that in, and then add a space. There's the I value, so I'll type an I and paste that in and add a space. And there's the D value, so I'll type a D and paste that in. With the M301 command typed in, click the Send button. Now the values are set, but they're not saved. So now let's save the settings. Type M500 and then click the Send button. M500 is the Save Settings command. So now that the PID loop has been tuned, let's test it out by heating the nozzle to 220 degrees. Now I'll show this side by side with the before version. These are time-lapsed, of course, the actual time was five minutes of watching the nozzle come up to temperature. You can see the before version just can't get locked in. It goes up too high, overcompensates and drops too low, and it just does that over and over but the after version gets right on to 220 degrees and locks in. The after is a lot more stable. One thing I want to mention is that I used a temperature of 220 degrees when tuning the PID loop because I often print at or near that temperature. But this PID loop will now work for pretty much any temperature that I print at. 
I mean, I'm usually at least at 200 degrees and generally not more than about 235 degrees. So 220 is a nice middle ground. So there we have it. Even if you don't have a menu item on the printer to do it, performing a PID auto-tune is actually a relatively simple matter as long as you're able to type commands directly to the printer. And even though the officially downloadable Mac OS version of Pronterface is a 32-bit app, there is a 64-bit version available so Mac users with a recent operating system can still run it. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, let's go print something cool with a consistent hot end temperature. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this episode, a thumbs up would be great. And if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you could do exactly that. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free and an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BV3D channel.